Hi, I'm Pastor Steve Berry, and I'm pastor of the First Presbyterian Church in Graniteville, Vermont. I want to thank you for joining with us today on Father's Day to participate in this online worship service. This morning, I am so excited to be able to invite you to the reopening of the First Presbyterian Church in Graniteville, Vermont, after 16 months of online worship services on Sunday, July 4th at 10 a.m., we will be holding our first in-person worship service in the sanctuary of the First Presbyterian Church in Graniteville. The wearing of masks will be optional to each worshiper. The church will provide masks and hand sanitizer for those who would like to use them. And we are also encouraging families to sit together whenever possible. Most importantly, we want everyone who chooses to come and worship to feel safe and comfortable during our worship time. We will continue to post weekly messages online for those who are unable to attend worship in person in Graniteville. This is such exciting news to all of us here in Graniteville, and we would love to have you join us for the reopening service on Sunday, July 4th at 10 a.m. Well, God bless you, and we will look forward to either seeing you in person at First Presbyterian, Graniteville, or online at the church's Facebook page, or on Stephen Berry Ministries' YouTube channel uh, every Sunday or whenever you want to tune in and uh, watch a message. Now we are blessed this morning to have our wonderful pianist, Louita Tillou, play for us a beautiful piano hymn entitled, My Heavenly Father Watches Over Me. My name is Louita, and I'm playing for you, My Heavenly Father Watches Over Me. <laughs>
Hi, welcome back. The title of my message today is The Call of a Father. The Call of a Father. In 1974, American singer and songwriter Harry Chapin recorded a song titled Cats in the Cradle. Some of you will remember that. The song is about a father who is too busy to spend time with his son, instead offering vague promises to spend time with him in the future. Well, in time, the boy grows up to become a man very much like his father, focus on career and other personal pursuits at the expense of the family relations and his relationship with his son. As a father grows old and finally has time to look back on his life, he deeply desires to get to know his adult son and have a meaningful relationship with him. Sadly, the father comes to realize that his son is absorbed with the same materialistic priorities that he had, and so a close relationship will never happen. The last verse concludes with this very sad line, As I hung up the phone, it occurred to me, he'd grown up just like me. My boy was just like me. Isn't that sad? The song reminds us of the universal influence one generation has on another. Family traits are often passed down from parents to children, and this cycle has been repeated for thousands and thousands of years. You know, we get a glimpse of how dysfunction and blessings are passed on from generation to generation. In the book of Exodus, chapter 20, verses 5 through 6, it says this, You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. Well, that seems kind of harsh, doesn't it? But it reveals a, a truth that we live with in this world. You know, the best way to understand this truth is to understand that the dysfunction and the blessing and emotional and spiritual health of one generation is passed on from one generation to another unless there is something that changes that reality. It said very clearly that those who loved God and followed God and obeyed him, uh, they passed on generation to, uh, blessing and blessing to each generation. And those that hated God uh, passed down dysfunction and sin. You know, those are very serious warnings and very serious truths. Because you and I, we learn to parent our children from none other than our own parents. Often we just parent our children the same way we were parented. Without giving it another thought, if our parents were emotionally and spiritually healthy, then we will most likely parent our children with the same set of values and beliefs as a foundation for how we parent our children. Or if we feel that our parents were too strict or too loose, we often vow to do the opposite of how they parented us. Often this means that we become very liberal or very strict in our parenting style and the pendulum swings all the way from one extreme to the other. If you think about a pendulum on a clock and how it goes from one side to the other side and swings back and forth and if you have one side is very liberal parenting and the other side is very extreme, harsh parenting, that uh, often if we were parented in one of those two places, that we will often swing back to the opposite. But you know, the Lord would have us find balance and to be right in the middle because that is when the most energy is released and the, it is the place of life, a healthy balance between uh, truth and grace. And truth sometimes can be difficult to deal with, and grace is, of course, full of grace. But that's how Jesus came forth. He came forth bearing truth and grace. And in that truth and grace that he brings to us, we find life. And that would be the hope that in our lives that we would learn to parent, and that in learning to parent that we would be able to find a healthy balance between maybe setting limits and giving grace and freedom and all those kinds of things. But the best place, you know, for us to be able to learn uh, healthy family values and, and blessings and limit, and limit setting and being able to parent well is that for us to be 
honest with how we were parented or the family dysfunction that we possibly had in our family, and to seek God and his word for direction and eternal truths and principles that will help us be healthy and balanced in our parenting. Well, the really good news is that the curse of generational family dysfunction is broken when we receive a new nature from God through Jesus and are filled with the person of the Holy Spirit. We are then able to be guided by the Holy Spirit and and the eternal truths of Scripture in parenting our children. Isn't that awesome? God changes us from the inside out. He wants us to be better parents than our parents and to find a place of life and balance in parenting our children. Let's look at some of the truths found in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Let's just walk through those four verses. First verse, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Well, on Father's Day, if uh, you're listening today and uh, the uh, kids or the children are listening to this uh, message, and it's Father's Day, you need to learn to obey your parents. Why does God say it? Because it's the right thing to do. It's right for you to obey them, not if they ask you to do something that is wrong or uh, unlawful. You don't have to obey them in those situations, but certainly for your parents, if they're setting limits and, and, and choosing to try to teach you between the difference between right and wrong, you need to respect that and obey them when they ask you to do things and to be respectful of them. In fact, verse 2 says, honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise that it may go well with you, and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. Well, this is a promise. If we are respectful to our parents, whether I'm an adult or whether I'm a child, then uh, it's the first commandment with a promise. And the promise is that it will go well with us, and we will enjoy long life on this earth. That's a great promise. You know, we should be wanting to honor our father and mother, and respect them. And so if you're a child today or a teenager or whatever you are, and you think, I don't, I don't like to honor my father and mother. They, they don't understand my life. They don't understand what I'm doing. You know, God is saying to you, honor your father and mother, and you will be blessed as a result of that. You'll have a good attitude, and someday you will very likely pass on that value to your children, and you will be glad when they pay honor to you and your, your spouse. Verse 4 is the one I want to focus on today because it addresses fathers. Verse 4 says, Fathers, do not exasperate or provoke your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Let me just read that to you again. Fathers, do not exasperate or provoke your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Now, I want you to hold on to that because that's your Mission today, dads, if you're listening, God is saying to you, don't exasperate or provoke your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. And we're going to talk about what that means and what that looks like. You know, the Greek meaning of the word exasperate is means to anger or irritate, to provoke, to anger, irritation, or resentment. You know, if you're too harsh with your kids and you're not speaking life and instead you're speaking death or you know, that is only going to bring around anger and hurt and irritation and eventually re- end in resentment. Some of you maybe have been, were raised in families where that happened. And to this day, you resent your, your father or your mother because of the way that they raised you and the way that they treated you. Now, God has given those of us who are fathers and mothers, but today's Father's Day, a unique and powerful role to fulfill with our children. We influence them greatly, either for good or for ill, or for bad. Some children grow up and vow that they will never be like their dads. They'll spend their whole lives reacting against their fathers. But even then, the father is exerting a strong influence over the child, unfortunately in a negative manner instead of positively. So dads, we have a 
big responsibility. We have a big impact on our children. If we stay and parent our children and do our best to be good, faithful fathers, we'll have a positive impact on them. If we leave or we mistreat them or we exasperate them or uh, cause them to be provoked to anger or resentment, then our legacy will be one of negativity and resentment. You know, hopefully, as Christian fathers, we will bless our children with a rich legacy of the things of God so that we they will want to follow him all their lives. It says, fathers, do not exasperate, provoke your children. It said, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. So we're not supposed to frustrate them or make them angry, but we're also supposed to bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. This is the call of the Father, to bring up our children in the training and instruction of the Lord. Well, what does that mean? It means that you need to have your own walk with the Lord. You need to have a connection with God. You need to be learning about God and his principles and his truths and his uh, uh, encouragement and the things that are found in the word of God. How can you or I teach our children if we don't know those things ourselves? This is the call of the Father to us and to be fathers that we can bring up our children in the training and instruction of the Lord. You know, when my son Jared was uh, growing up, he was uh, participating in a, a Little League team. And uh, he was on this team, and right next door to us was a, a dad and his son, and he, his son was good friends with my son Jared, and his father was the coach. Well, I would go to the games and or practices and the games, and uh, often his father, uh, my, my Jared's friend's father, would not show up. There would be nobody there to coach the team. Well, I had never really played baseball in my life much. I played in Little League for a little while and then never played again. So I didn't really understand a lot about the game, but it was just very sad to see his son there at the at the game or practicing and waiting for his dad and all the other kids, his friends, waiting for the father to show up to coach the team. Well, the father had a problem with alcohol. He was an alcoholic. And so, anyways, as time went on, I eventually was asked if I would take over and do my best to coach the team and to be there. So I went and got a book on baseball and on coaching Little League teams and stepped in in the place of uh, my neighbor's son's uh, father. And it was very sad to me that this young man didn't have any choice. His father was absent. He wasn't there for him. And I was glad I was able to uh, step in and do the best I could as, as little as I knew. You know, half of parenting is showing up. And half of being a good father is being able to be there for your, your son or your daughter. And so I just want to encourage you that one of the ways that we can, you know, be a good dad is just to show up. We may not have it all together. We may not know all the things about God or how to do that, but we need to be present. We need to be involved in their lives and, and be a dad who's there. When they're in events at school, do your best to get there. You know, when they're in plays or they're in sports or any of those kinds of things, you know, be there, be present, be there to watch them. And if you've got a problem or you've got some issues that you need to deal with, like alcoholism, then go and get some help for yourself and don't pass that generational dysfunction on down to your, your children. You know, I just want to reinforce this truth to bring your children up in the admonition of the Lord. Well, for me as a dad to be able to bring my child and uh, my adult children continually up into the, in the Lord... I must be committed to bringing myself up in the training and instruction of the Lord. I need to be learning about God. I need to be studying the Bible. I need to be having devotionals. I need to be uh, doing something to improve my knowledge of God. And that usually means going to church, getting connected, listening to services online, reading a book, uh, getting involved in a Bible study, doing something where you put yourself in a place where you can grow in your knowledge and your wisdom of God. Then you'd be in a, you'll be in a good place to be able to advise your children on the question, big questions that they have. Or you'll know somebody that you can ask those questions to who has a, a good knowledge of God's Word. You know, the advice and counsel that my children need from me is not just my opinion, but my advice and counsel based solidly 
on the truths of God's word. In Genesis 49, the dying patriarch Jacob imparts his final blessing to his twelve sons. The verses tell us of his blessing on Joseph and Benjamin, his two sons by his beloved wife Rachel. While Judah received the higher blessing in that the Messiah would come from his family line in verse chapter 49, verse 10, the most full blessing is reserved for the beloved Joseph. Jacob pulls out all the stops and blessings gush forth in a torrent. If you read that passage of scripture in chapter 49, verses 25 and 26, Jacob is blessing his son. He just speaks one blessing after another over his life. And it was very common then for the uh, the adult to bless the oldest child and also to bless their sons. And, and the children wanted their father's blessing on them. Maybe that's not the thing that people do today, but, you know, it's something that you and I need to be conscious of as dads. Our children are always looking for our blessing. They're always looking to be affirmed from us. They always are looking and checking with us to make sure that we love them, that we're proud of them, that we care about them. And those are ways for us to speak life into them and to speak blessing upon them. You know, God wants you and I to impart his blessing to our children. He wants you and I to speak his blessing to our children, that he's entrusted into our care. The words that we speak to them are so very, very important. We need to be speaking words of life over ourselves, and because oftentimes we grew up and, and we didn't have people speaking blessings into our life. And so it's important now if uh, in a relationship with God that we take hold of those truths and we speak words of life to counteract the lies the enemy has put upon us through people in our lives. So we need to speak words of life. I'm a new creature in Christ. Old things have passed away and all things have become new. What a hopeful promise that is. And I can say that to myself if I feel myself falling back into old habits and patterns and to remind myself that it is no longer I who lives, but it is Christ who lives in me. Both of those things are great truths and encouraging truths. And so I need to speak those things into my life, but I also, as a dad, need to speak those into my children's life. Proverbs 18.21 says, Death and life are in the power of the tongue. And those who love it will eat its fruit. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. And those who love it will eat its fruit. You know, often with our children, we can get caught up with scolding them and focusing on getting rid of whatever we consider as bad behavior. Sometimes it's only because we're concerned about how our children's behavior will affect our image with others. And our focus is on calling out what we don't approve of or want. In our frustration, we can say things like, you're a bad boy or you're a bad girl. You're not good enough. You are impossible. You are so naughty. You make me crazy. You always do this. You never do this. I wish you weren't born. Isn't that terrible? And then sometimes in moments of anger and frustration in our attempt to uh, help our children to succeed and make different choices, we end up focusing on the negative. We see all the things that we don't want kids to do. And we're so busy punishing and having consequences to come up for those things that I know being a parent, uh, I could have grounded all my kids probably the first, uh, once they got old enough to act out the first two or three years, they could have been grounded until they were 65 and ready to collect Social Security. <laughs> but that wasn't very practical. And so, you know, we have to learn to parent. But if we just focus on the negative, our relationship with our children can be negative, negative, negative. And we're, that's a, 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 an example of how we exasperate our children and exasperate ourselves. So I want to encourage you today that I want you to remember this acronym that I'm going to give you. It's C-E-B-G. C E B G. You can remember it by C big. It's just a way to help you remember it. And what it stands for is catch them being good. Catch them being good. You know, I, I learned that a long time ago and I used it when I was driving a school bus. 
It's so easy to focus on what you don't want kids to do. You don't want them, in the case of the bus driver, you don't want them standing in the aisle. You don't want them hitting each other. You don't want them doing this. Your own kids, you have a list of things, you know, you don't want them to do. And it's so easy to be focused on, you know, what they aren't doing and try to punish that. And that just creates a terrible, negative, exasperating situation. So what I want you to think about doing, dads, today is to make a list of the behaviors that you want them to exhibit and do. Oftentimes we don't remember what those are. We just know when they don't do it, what they are. It's usually the opposite of the negative behavior that we can be trying to stop in our children. If you want your children to not be disrespectful, then you focus on catching them, yes, you guessed it, being respectful. You can confront the disrespect but more importantly, when they choose to be respectful, you need to be heaping praise and, and uh, thanksgiving on that and building their self-esteem and say, wow, I'm so proud of you for being respectful to your mom or to your grandmother or to your sister or your brother. When you see a child being respectful, don't just take it for granted like this should be inbred in them, that they should just come out being respectful because they, they aren't like you and I. We didn't come out that way. We have to learn these things, and so we're here to encourage our kids and our children to be able to have the values that we want them to have, and that means we should focus more on catching them being good than catching them being bad. You know, that's just a, a powerful winning combination, because the more that you affirm your child, the more that you bless them, the more that you speak life to them, and the more that you're very aware of what you want your child's behavior and attitudes and values to be, when you see those things exhibited in their behavior, in their conversations, and in their choices, then that's a wonderful time to affirm those values and to say, wonderful job. I really appreciate who you are. I'm so thankful that you're my son or my daughter. I, you are so uh, respectful. You're so sharing. You're so giving. You're so kind. All of these things that we want our kids to be. Thanks for controlling your body. Thanks for sitting still when you need to. Thanks for not sassing us when we ask you to go to your room. All of those things are ways for us to catch our children being good and to keep our focus on parenting, on in encouraging and blessing the kind of behaviors and attitudes and values that we want our children to have. You know... Kids are going to be kids. Children will be children. But what does Romans 8.28 say? It says, And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Well, why am I sharing that with you? Well, because sometimes in parenting, and you know, we have 13 grandchildren now, and we've raised four children. We had foster children, and we've uh, had a lot of experience in raising children and having our own children. And in that experience, you learn what things not to do and what things to do. And sometimes, you know, I can just share that I, we've overreacted. My wife and I overreacted to many things that our kids did. And sometimes we thought, oh, no, this is terrible. The world's coming to an end. And, and we overreacted and came down too hard. Well, you know, it's very important for us to build our children's self-esteem. It's very important for us to praise them. And most things are not that consequential. You know, life goes on. And in this passage in Romans 8, 28, it says, we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him and have been called according to his purpose. That's kind of like a default uh, promise that when things get bad and things don't work out the way they should, that if we love God and we're called to according to his purpose, God will somehow transform even the worst of situations around for our good, our children's good, and for his glory and honor. That's a wonderful promise. God is able to transform the worst of situations around for our good and the good of our children as long as we are called according to his purpose. Very important. Fathers, it says, do not exasperate or provoke your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. You see how this keeps coming back to us as dads being focused on being called according to God's purpose. God made us, and he made us for relationship with himself. And we can be great fathers if we are connected to God, if we're learning about God and we're listening and trying to learn of him and hear his voice speak to us and guide us as dads. 
You know, Romans 8.35 says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? Well, I want to share with you that that's a, an incredible promise for you and I individually. But it also sets the foundation and is a template for how we should love our children. It says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Well, our motto should be, Who will separate my children from my love? As a dad, is there anything that they could do that would cause me to ever stop loving them? No. Just like God, there's nothing we can do that would stop God from loving us. And we need to have the, the same mindset that we are here to love our children, to encourage our children, and yes, set limits, but also help them to make good choices and succeed in life. And the way that we do that is by catching them being good, speaking life into them, and not just putting up limits and boundaries and becoming so frustrated that they're exasperated and we're exasperated. We can speak life to them, and we can realize that God loves them. He made them and created them as, and has entrusted our children to us. And what a wonderful blessing and opportunity that God entrusts the care and love and nurture and the growing up and uh, in the nurturings of our, of our children unto us. They're his creations. He has a plan and a purpose for them. You know, the word of God is rich with words of life. God's promises, his perspective about how valuable each of our lives are. In Proverbs chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, it says, Hear, my children, the instruction of a father, and give attention to no understanding, for I give you good doctrine, do not forsake my law. Well, what's that saying? It's saying we should listen. We're his children. We should listen to the instruction of a father, certainly the instruction of our heavenly father, and we should listen to the instruction of our earthly father and give attention to no understanding. We should try to understand God. We should try to understand how to make good choices in this life and what constitutes good choices. Because God gives us a good doctrine. He gives us a good revelation of those truths. Do not forsake the word of God. Do not forsake my law. Proverbs 22, verse 6, it says, Train up a child in the way he should go, or she, and when he or she is old, they will not depart from it. You know, that's a great promise. Our job as dads, and of course as moms, but today's Father's Day, our job is to train up my children in the way they should go. And when they're old, they won't depart from it. Well, we took our children to church. We made sure that they were involved in church activities. They went to youth group. They went to church camp. And the reason that we did that, in spite of their objections many times, was because I took this, and we, my brother and I took this verse very seriously. God had entrusted our children to us, and our job was to train up our children in the way they should go. Well, what way is that? They should walk with the Lord. They need to be in sync with him. He made them and created them and has a plan for them. And they need to learn about God and experience God. If I don't take my children to church, that's not going to happen. Unless I teach them myself at home, which many parents choose to do that. But we have a responsibility to do that. And it says if we lay that foundation for them, you know, no one can force a child to believe in God or to follow God. That is something that comes from choice. But we have a responsibility as parents to bring our children in to church and to expose them to religious instruction and the experiences of God so that at some point, it doesn't say they won't wander away from the way we would like them to walk in or in the way of God, but it says that when they're old, they won't depart from it. At some point, they'll go through adolescence and all the struggles and challenges that are there, and they may test and, and try the boundaries that uh, set around them to keep them safe, and that's all part of growing up. But at some point, they will come to a place where they're, when they get older, where they will look back at their heritage and say, you know, these, doing my own thing, leading my own life hasn't worked out well. I, I think I need to follow the Lord. And I'll have something, they will have something that we've given to them that they can depend upon to go back to, which is the knowledge of God, the experience of God. And when things are tough, like the prodigal son, when things were tough for him, he knew he had a father who loved him that he could go and return to because he had experienced his father. You know, perhaps your earthly father didn't speak words of life to you, or worse, he was abusive to you. I can't even imagine the pain you have carried throughout your life as a result of this, or the, the pain that you carry today. But I do have good news for you. Your heavenly father is now your daddy. 
If you've called on God and opened your heart to him, the God has put the Holy Spirit inside of you. Because of Jesus, you have been given his righteousness and holiness, and God puts you the person of the Holy Spirit within you. And he, God the Father, becomes your heavenly Father by your choice. And God will speak words of life to you in your inner person over and over and over again. He will bring healing and wholeness into your life in the areas where you were wounded. He will renew your mind with the truths of the Word of God. You know, isn't that powerful? His Spirit now lives in you. If you have been born again, God has filled you with His Holy Spirit, and your spiritual DNA has changed from your earthly heritage to that of your heavenly Father. You are no longer just a, uh, a product of your uh, family lineage on earth here, but you have a new Father. You have a heavenly Father. You have an eternal destination and a promise of eternity with God the Father. God has made you whole and clean, and he's put the Spirit of God inside of you and will continually work with you and finish the work that he began in, in you the day you came to him, the day you were born, until the day you see him face to face in paradise. God created you and myself with a plan and a purpose, and that per plan and purpose was to do good works, to love God and to love others with God's love. Those are the things that we can teach our children. Psalm 68 verse 5 says that a father to the fatherless, a defender of widows, is God in his holy habitation. You know, that's a powerful passage of scripture. When I ran a foster care agency for 21 years, we used to teach that to foster parents. And we would often speak that into children's lives whose fathers weren't able to be there for them or their parents weren't able to parent them. You say, well, I had a father. He just wasn't very good or he was fantastic. The question is, who is the fatherless that are being referred to in Psalm 68? Well, I realized as I was working in foster care, I, I had a father. My father didn't desert me. He was there with me. And uh, eventually he came and gave his life to the Lord. And I loved him very much. But he, like all men, wasn't perfect. And he wasn't a perfect father. He did his best, but he had some flaws and mistakes. And we had to work those things out later in my life with him. But I realized one day as I was reading this, and I thought, everyone is fatherless on this earth to one degree or another, since the only perfect man who ever lived was Jesus. And none of us have Jesus as our earthly father. Perhaps you had a father who was 90% good, but 10% bad. Well, that means that in that 10%, in that area that your father wasn't able to give you what God intended you to have through having a father, that you were fatherless. And when you come to Jesus and are born again, the father of the fatherless is now your father in all the areas that you need healing or that I need healing in. If your dad was 90% a failure and 10% wonderful, well, then the same truth applies to you also. God is now your perfect father in the 90% of the dysfunction that you experienced through your dad. And you can Walk in the 10% of the good things that he did, and God will continually heal you and make up for the woundedness and hurt and the lack in your life that your own earthly father wasn't able to give you. And your children will be that much better off for it because you will be healed and made whole and you will be able to walk in God's truths and principles and you'll be able to pass down that heritage to your children. Isn't that wonderful? Our good, good Father will now help guide you as you live life and as you parent your children. When you are aware of your need and honest about your weaknesses to be the Father that you want to be, then you can call on God to help you find balance and help, health in your parenting. You can also ask God to bring healing into your life and extend grace and mercy for the ways that your earthly father failed you. Words of life are so important. Proverbs 18.21 says, Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. The eternal truth, that eternal truth is so powerful. Each of us has the ability to speak death and life to those around us. But if you're wounded then we need to speak life to ourselves by speaking the promises and blessings of God upon our lives also. 
I want you to remember something. It's a big responsibility. Our children will become what you tell them they will be. Our children will become what you tell them they will be. A child's self-esteem is formed during the first six years of their lives, primarily. Of course, their self-esteem is still being formed and shaped every moment of every day, even into adulthood. We all struggle with those issues of a lack of self-esteem in one way or another, or some have great self-esteem. But those first six years, children are so impressionable in their sense of self, their sense of worth. Uh, is totally dependent on the words that we speak into their lives. Children that have ADHD or ADD, they can be very trying to parent because of, of the disability that they have. But it's so important for you and I in parenting our children that we understand the uniqueness of each child and the gift that they are to us. And to measure every word that we say to our children. To measure... Every word that you say to your children, or we say, don't just speak everything that comes into your mind. Don't just speak out things in frustration because you can and, and you're irritated. Think about the words that you speak into their lives and how it will affect them for the long term and the short term. Use the opportunity that you have in their lives to speak blessings and life-giving words of affirmation. Isn't that exactly what God does to us? He speaks words of life to us, his children. And when we need correction, he does it with love and kindness to us. Not with harshness, but with love and compassion. When we need correction, he does it with love and kindness to us. Not with harshness or disgust, but with love and compassion. You know, we too have the opportunity to speak words of life and healing to our children. You know, here are some words of life that you can speak over your children that are biblically true. I'm going to try to post these words on the church's Facebook page if I can, so that you can have access to them. And if not, you can just email me at pastorstephen at aol.com, and I will be glad to send you a copy of these words. You know, from Jeremiah 29, verse 11, it says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Those are great plans. That's the attitude that we should have towards our children. We want we should be speaking life into them. That God wants to, to, to want them to prosper. We want them not to be harmed and to have a hope and a future. And that God will give them that. You know, these are just simple statements that I want to give you. And maybe as I'm saying them, you'll think, oh, I need that one. I'm going to write that one down. That's great. Or you can go back and watch this and write some of these down. Sometimes if nobody spoke words of life into our life, we're not sure what to speak into our kids' lives. But I'm going to give you a bunch of them. And I think that as I read through those, I hope maybe those things will minister to you also if you have a, a need to be affirmed and encouraged and have those negative messages that maybe you received as a child uh, done away with and replaced with these positive messages. So I'm just going to read down through this list of words of life, things that you can say to your children. I see God working in your life. As your dad, I am so very, very proud of you. I love you and Jesus loves you most of all. I know that I'm not always a perfect dad, but I love you and feel blessed to be your father. You're going to grow up and be a wonderful father or mother someday to your own children. I can see it happening. I'm so proud of you and I love you so much. I know you have I know that you have got what it takes to overcome this challenge. That's in Philippians 4:13. You can do this. I know you can. I believe in you. God is always with you. Don't worry. You are beloved child of the King. You are a gift from God to me and to our family and to the world. James 1.17 You can do all things through Christ who gives you strength. Philippians 4.13 God has a great plan for your life. Jeremiah 29.11 You are strong in the Lord. Ephesians 6.10 with God, all things are possible. 
Matthew 19.26 You are fearfully and wonderfully made. Psalm 139.14 You are loved no matter what. There is nothing you can do that will change that. Romans 5.8 Let me pray for you or let me pray with you. 1 Thessalonians 5.17 You can trust Jesus with this situation. You can trust Jesus with this fear. You can trust Jesus with this desire. You can trust Jesus to complete the work he began in you. Proverbs chapter 3 verses 5 through 6. Let me pray for you. Let me pray with you for this situation. I can't wait to see the good plans that God has in store for your life. Well, that's just a few of the promises and the blessings that are based in Scripture, things that we can speak into our kids' lives. And with the more that we practice speaking those things, the more that we will see their eyes light up, the more that they'll respond with loving us and caring about us and responding and feeling secure in who they are with us, the more that we can see ourselves creating and, and pumping them up with God's life and promises and His love and our love for them. Now I want to just ask you to uh, join me this morning as we pray the Lord's Prayer, which is, of course, known as Our Father. And I want you, as we pray it, to realize that God loves you. He's chosen you to be a dad. And uh, he will give you everything and the strength that you need to be a wonderful dad, a fantastic dad, because he is your Abba Father, your good, good father. And he lives inside of you and will direct you and order your steps and help you to speak words of life into your children, just as he speaks word of life into all who come to him. Would you just join me as we say this Lord's Prayer together? And then at the end, I'm going to say a prayer for all the dads today. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thine will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. I'd just like to pray for all the dads this morning that are watching. And if you're standing in a room with your dad or someone who is a father, would you please just reach out, put your hand on their shoulder or take their hand as I pray a blessing over them and you can join me and agree with that blessing over their life. Father God, I lift up all the dads today who are listening to this message and I pray your blessing upon them. I pray for your wisdom and your kindness and your love and your compassion. I pray, Father, that they would see their children with the same eyes that you see them, that you would help them to be calm and patient, that you would have, give them new hope and a new promise and, and being able to speak life and words of love and compassion and affirmation into their children's life. I pray as they do this that you would also speak words of life into their lives and uh, that you would undo any damage that was done by being born into imperfect families, that you would bring healing to them and that you would continue to affirm them and let them know how valuable and loved and cared for they are no matter what they have done in their lives, that those, that those sins have been forgiven, that you've washed them away and that they are as pure and as, uh, as white snow that they are holy and they are called and that your anointing is upon them. I just pray for each of them to be rejuvenated and refreshed and encouraged today to go forth, to hear your voice, to walk in the power of your spirit and to be a blessing continually in the lives of their children, just as you are in our lives. I thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. After every catch he makes on the baseball field, he'll look to you to make sure you're smiling. When her friends make the fourth grade pep squad, but she doesn't, she'll look to you for comfort. 
When she feels misunderstood by her brothers and sisters, she'll look to you for understanding. They'll never stop looking to you. When she walks down the aisle on that magical day, she'll look to you to bring peace to her anxious heart. When he plays his first concert with his new band, he'll look to your face in the crowd. When she makes choices that will break your heart, she'll eventually look to you for forgiveness and restoration. They'll never stop looking to you. And you can never stop. You must never stop looking to God. They don't need you to be perfect. They just need you to be authentic and offer them Jesus anyway. They need you to try your very best. And even if you fail, they need to see you rise up again. They need you to follow hard after Jesus as best you can because they will never stop looking to you. Son, I'm writing these words to you because you are, and always have been, the legacy I've wanted to leave. And now, it's your moment. It's your chance to leave a legacy of loving Jesus with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. They'll never stop looking to you. And that's the way God created it to be. Hello, my name is Louita. I'd like to play for you in his time. Mm -hmm. 